In this section, we'll look at the knee. First, we'll look at the bones, then the knee joint and how it moves, then the muscles that move it, and lastly, the vessels and nerves. Let's see the bones, starting with the femur. We saw the proximal end of the femur in the last section. Now let's look at the distal end. The two smoothly curved surfaces are the lateral condyle and the medial condyle. The deep notch which separates them is the intercondylar notch. Above the two condyles are the epicondyles, lateral and medial. The sharp corner on the medial epicondyle is the adductor tubercle. This prominent ridge is the medial supracondylar line. This one is the lateral supracondylar line. Now we'll add the tibia and the fibula to the picture. The tibia and the fibula are fixed to each other firmly by two joints, the proximal and distal tibiofibular joints. There's almost no movement at either of these joints. Let's take a look at the proximal end of the tibia. This is the medial condyle. This is the lateral condyle. On top of the two condyles are two quite separate articular surfaces. They're much flatter than those on the femur. The rugged expanse between the articular surfaces is the interarticular area. This prominent lump on the front, the tibial tubercle, is the final insertion of the quadriceps tendon. The small facet under here is for the fibula, which we'll add. This is the head of the fibula. This is the neck. The head of the fibula is the point of attachment of a major ligament of the knee joint, as we'll see. The space on each side of the knee between the femoral condyle and the tibial condyle is occupied by a crescent-shaped piece of cartilage, a meniscus, which we'll see shortly. The space in the middle, the intercondylar notch, is occupied by the two cruciate ligaments. The intercondylar notch and its contents divide the knee joint into two almost separate halves. There's one more bone to add to the picture, the patella, or kneecap. The patella, as we'll see, is embedded within the quadriceps tendon, which comes from up here, and inserts on the tibia down here on the tibial tubercle. On the back of the patella, the articular surface is divided into facets. These articulate either with the femoral condyles, when the knee is flexed, or with this central articular area, when it's extended. Now that we've seen the bones of the knee joint, let's see how the joint looks in the living body. In building up our picture of this quite complicated joint, there are several structures that we need to understand. First, the two joint cartilages, or menisci. Then the ligaments, the two cruciate ligaments and the two collateral ligaments. Then the patella and the quadriceps tendon on the front. And lastly, the capsule, which encloses the joint. Here are the two articular surfaces of the tibia. The two menisci sit on top of them. Here are the menisci. They're made of flexible fibrocartilage. They're shaped a little differently. The lateral one is almost a circle. The medial one is more C-shaped. In cross-section, each meniscus is thick at the outer edge and thin at the inner edge. The two ends of each meniscus are attached to the interarticular area of the tibia. The medial ones far apart, the lateral ones close together. In addition, each meniscus is attached all the way around its edge, both above and below, to the joint capsule. Here's part of the joint capsule. We'll see more of it later. The lateral meniscus is much more mobile than the medial one, partly because its two ends are attached close together, partly because of a big difference in the mobility of the joint capsule around the edge. 
By filling in the spaces between the femoral and tibial condyles, the menisci produce an even distribution of synovial fluid to nourish and lubricate the articular cartilage of the femur and tibia. Now let's look at the two pairs of ligaments which hold the bones together at the knee joint. The two cruciate ligaments on the inside and the two collateral ligaments on the outside. We'll look at the cruciate ligaments first. They're the important structures which prevent forward and backward movement of the femur on the tibia. Their name comes from the fact that they form a cross, like this. Here's the anterior cruciate ligament, seen from in front. Here's the posterior cruciate ligament, seen from behind. To get a better look at them, we'll remove the lateral condyle of the femur. Now we can see the whole of the anterior cruciate ligament. The anterior cruciate ligament goes from here on the tibia to here on the femur, on the inner aspect of the lateral condyle. The anterior cruciate ligament prevents the femur from moving backward in relation to the tibia. Now we look at the posterior cruciate ligament we'll remove the anterior cruciate ligament to see it better. The posterior cruciate ligament goes from here on the femur to here on the back of the tibia. The posterior cruciate ligament stops the femur from moving forward on the tibia. By preventing backward and forward movement, the cruciate ligaments ensure that the condyles of the femur stay in one place as they roll on the condyles of the tibia. Without them, the femur would roll off the back of the tibia in flexion and would roll off the front of it in extension. Now let's look at the two collateral ligaments. The fibular collateral ligament on the lateral side and the tibial collateral ligament on the medial side. The tibial collateral ligament goes from the medial epicondyle of the femur to the anteromedial aspect of the proximal tibia. The tibial collateral ligament blends with the capsule of the knee joint behind and also in front. On its inner aspect, it's firmly attached to the edge of the medial meniscus, which is here. Now let's look at the rather different fibular collateral ligament. It goes from the lateral epicondyle of the tibia to the head of the fibula. The fibular collateral ligament stands out from the side of the knee joint. Unlike its tibial counterpart, it doesn't blend with the joint capsule. It's not attached to the meniscus. When the knee joint is extended, both the collateral ligaments are tight. When it's flexed, they become less tight. The function of the collateral ligaments is to keep the femoral and tibial condyles together and thus to prevent the knee joint from bending from side to side, like this or like this. In addition to the obvious knee movements, flexion and extension, it's also possible for the tibia to rotate a little on the femur, like this. This rotation can happen only when the knee is flexed. When it's extended, the tightness of the collateral ligaments makes rotation impossible. The next structure we need to add in building up our picture of the knee joint is the quadriceps tendon, and along with it, the patella. Here's the distal end of the quadriceps muscle, which we'll see in more detail later in this section. Here's the quadriceps tendon. The patella, which is here, is enfolded within the tendon. The part of the tendon below the patella is known as the patellar ligament. On the medial side and on the lateral side, the tendon is continuous with the capsule of the knee joint. Between the quadriceps tendon and the femur is an extension of the knee joint cavity, the quadriceps bursa. It's lined with synovial membrane. This lubricated pocket enables the quadriceps tendon to slide easily on the femur. Now we'll complete our picture of the knee joint by adding the fibrous capsule which encloses it. 
Here's the knee joint with the joint capsule intact. On the medial side, the thin capsule is continuous with the tibial collateral ligament. But on the lateral side, the capsule is separated from the fibular collateral ligament. On the back of the joint, the capsule is thick and strong. The thickened posterior capsule prevents hyperextension of the knee joint. Here, we've divided the fibrous capsule to see its inner surface. It's lined on the inside with synovial membrane all the way around the joint, except at the back. At the back, as we'll see if we remove the capsule, the thin synovial membrane, here it is, passes forward around the cruciate ligaments, covering them on the front. Besides being the largest joint in the body, the knee joint is also much the most complicated. Before we move on to look at the muscles which produce knee movement, let's review what we've seen of the bones and of the knee joint. On the femur, here's the lateral condyle and epicondyle, the medial condyle and epicondyle, the adductor tubercle and the intercondylar notch. On the tibia, here's the lateral condyle, the medial condyle, the tibial tubercle and the facet for the fibula. Here's the head of the fibula, the neck of the fibula, the proximal tibiofibular joint, and the patella. Here's the medial meniscus, the lateral meniscus, the anterior cruciate and posterior cruciate ligaments, the fibular collateral ligament, the tibial collateral ligament, the quadriceps tendon, the patellar ligament, and the joint capsule. Now we'll move on to look at the muscles which produce movement at the knee joint. We've met most of them already. The one muscle that extends the knee is the massive quadriceps. We saw it briefly in the last section. We'll take a better look at it now. The main flexors of the knee are the so-called hamstring muscles, semimembranosus, semitendinosus and biceps femoris. Besides flexing the knee, the hamstring muscles also extend the hip. We took a good look at them in the last section. Here we'll just revisit their insertions. In addition, we'll look at three muscles at the back of the knee that we haven't yet seen, popliteus, gastrocnemius, and plantaris. We'll start with quadriceps. Its name comes from the fact that it has four heads. Oddly, these are named as though they were separate muscles. Three of the heads arise from the femur. They're called vastus intermedius, vastus medialis, and vastus lateralis. The fourth head, rectus femoris arises from the hip bone. All four heads converge on the quadriceps tendon, which we've seen. We'll start with the deepest of the heads, vastus intermedius. Here it is. It forms a bulge on the front of the femur. Vastus intermedius arises from this broad area around the lateral aspect and front of the femur. Wrapped around the outside of vastus intermedius are vastus medialis and vastus lateralis. These two cover vastus intermedius almost completely. Their fibers run obliquely all the way round to the back. Here's lateralis, here's medialis, almost meeting it. Vastus lateralis arises from the lateral edge of the linear aspera and from the side and front of the greater trochanter. Vastus medialis arises from the medial edge of the linear aspera and from just below the lesser trochanter. The thin strip of bone between these two lines of origin provides the insertion of all the adductor muscles and also the origin of the short head of biceps. Now let's add 
rectus femoris to the picture. Here it is. Rectus femoris arises from the ilium just above the hip joint. Its tendon of origin has two parts, a posterior or reflected part and an anterior or straight part. The anterior part arises from this prominence, the anterior inferior iliac spine. The posterior part arises from just above the acetabulum. All four heads of quadriceps converge on the quadriceps tendon. The lowest fibers of vastus lateralis and medialis insert onto the sides of the patella. The principal action of the quadriceps muscle is to extend the knee. When the foot is off the ground, that action simply straightens the leg and holds it straight. When the foot is on the ground, the action of quadriceps has several important effects. In normal walking, quadriceps straightens the leg as the foot reaches the ground, then keeps the leg straight while the hamstring muscles extend the hip. Quadriceps is also one of the two big anti-gravity muscles of the lower extremity. Its partner, which we've seen already, is gluteus maximus. Acting together, quadriceps at the knee and gluteus maximus at the hip lift the body upward when we climb up hill when we rise from a sitting position and when we jump. The same muscle actions propel us forward when we're pushing a heavy load. In addition to these actions, when quadriceps and its partner, gluteus maximus, act in balance with the force of gravity, they control our rate of descent as we sit down and also when we walk downhill. We need to digress for a moment to look at a structure called the adductor canal, which lies between vastus medialis and the adjoining adductor longus muscle. The adductor canal is important because the femoral vessels run through it in their course from the front of the thigh to the back. Here's vastus medialis. Here are the adductor muscles, magnus behind, longus in front, and brevis up here. The adductor canal is formed by the groove between adductor longus and vastus medialis, and by this sheet of fascia, called the roof of the adductor canal, which bridges over between the muscles. The adductor canal is covered over by the sartorius muscle. We'll see the adductor canal again when we look at the blood vessels. Now let's move on and look at the muscles which produce flexion at the knee joint. We'll revisit the main flexors, the three hamstring muscles, and two minor flexors, sartorius and gracilis. Here are the hamstring muscles again. On the medial side, here are semimembranosus and semitendinosus. As we've seen, they both arise from the ischial tuberosity and insert on the medial side of the knee. Semimembranosus here, semitendinosus here. On the lateral side, here's biceps femoris. It arises both from the ischial tuberosity and from the femur and inserts down here on the head of the fibula. We've already seen that these three muscles, which usually act together, can produce either extension of the hip or flexion of the knee. Whether they do one, the other, or both, is determined by what other muscles are acting in opposition to them at the time. When flexion of the knee is resisted by quadriceps, the hamstring muscles produce extension at the hip. When extension of the hip is resisted by the hip flexors, the hamstring muscles produce flexion of the knee. In addition, the hamstring muscles, acting separately, produce medial rotation and lateral rotation at the knee joint. As we've seen, these movements can only happen when the knee is flexed. The two semi-muscles produce medial rotation. Biceps femoris produces lateral rotation. The other two minor knee flexors that we've seen already are sartorius and gracilis. Here's sartorius, which arises up here, 
Here's Gracilis, arising here. These two insert close to semitendinosus. Sartorius here, Gracilis here. We've already seen the actions of these two muscles at the hip. At the knee, they help to produce flexion. Now we'll complete our picture of the muscles around the knee by looking at three muscles at the back that we haven't met yet. Popliteus, gastrocnemius, and plantaris. Here's the popliteus muscle. It arises from this area on the back of the tibia and inserts up here on the lateral epicondyle of the femur. The tendon of popliteus passes through the capsule of the knee joint to reach its insertion. Popliteus is a minor flexor of the knee and it can also produce medial rotation of the tibia. Lying on top of popliteus is the small plantaris muscle. It's a vestigial structure. It arises from the lateral epicondyle of the femur. The tiny tendon of plantaris runs down on the back of this big muscle, soleus. We'll see where it ends up in the next section. Lying on top of the two small muscles that we've just seen is the much larger gastrocnemius muscle. Gastrocnemius arises by two heads from the back of the medial and lateral condyles of the femur. Gastrocnemius runs downward and joins with the underlying soleus muscle, which we'll see in the next section, to form the calcaneal tendon, or heel cord. Gastrocnemius has a slight flexing action at the knee, but its main action by far is at the ankle joint. We'll see it again in the next section. Now that we've seen all the muscles that arise or insert at the knee joint, let's see how they all fit together. You can use this overview as a brief review section. Here on the front are quadriceps, sartorius, and gracilis. On the back, here are semitendinosus and semimembranosus. Here's biceps femoris, and here's gastrocnemius. Here's plantaris and popliteus. Now we'll move on to look at the principal veins, arteries, and nerves in the region of the knee. We'll begin where we saw them last, just below the hip. We'll follow them to just below the knee. With the main artery and vein, there's a change of name that we need to understand. In the upper and middle thigh, they're known as the femoral vessels, but below the adductor hiatus, they're called the popliteal vessels. The same vessels, just a different name. Here's the thigh with the skin removed and a strip of subcutaneous fat taken out so that we can see the long saphenous vein. Here it's in the middle of its course from the ankle to the top of the thigh. To see the femoral vessels, we'll remove the superficial fat and deep fascia. Here are the femoral artery and vein at the point where we saw them last, disappearing beneath the sartorius muscle. To follow their course, we'll remove sartorius and also Gracilis. Here's vastus medialis. Here's adductor longus, with adductor magnus behind it. The femoral vessels pass beneath the roof of the adductor canal and through the adductor hiatus. To see where they emerge, we'll remove semimembranosus and semitendinosus and go round to the back. Here are the vessels emerging behind adductor magnus. They're now known as the popliteal artery and vein. A little above the knee, the popliteal vessels are joined by the sciatic nerve. At the back of the knee, the popliteal artery lies deep to the nerve and to the popliteal vein. To see the artery better, we'll go to a different dissection in which the muscles are intact and the nerve and the vein have been removed. Above the knee, which is just here, the popliteal artery gives off these two superior genicular arteries, lateral and medial. At the knee, it gives off these branches to the two heads of gastrocnemius. And below the knee, it gives off these two inferior genicular arteries, medial and lateral. The popliteal artery then disappears 
deep to the two heads of gastrocnemius. We'll see where the vessels go from there in the next section. Now let's look at the nerves. In the last section, we looked at three major nerves, the obturator, the femoral, and the sciatic. We'll follow the sciatic nerve in a minute. The obturator nerve and the femoral nerve we don't need to follow any further, except to remind ourselves of the muscles that they supply. As we've seen before, the obturator nerve supplies obturator externus, adductor brevis, and longus, and the anterior part of adductor magnus. The femoral nerve supplies iliacus, pectineus, all four heads of quadriceps, and sartorius. The obturator and femoral nerves also have sensory branches, some of which go below the knee. We'll leave these out. We'll go on now to look at the sciatic nerve. We saw the sciatic nerve a minute ago with the hamstring muscles absent. To see the whole picture, we'll add the hamstring muscles. Here are semimembranosus and semitendinosus. Here's biceps femoris. Here are the two heads of gastrocnemius. The space that's bounded by these muscles is called the popliteal fossa. As we saw in the previous section, the sciatic nerve passes deep to biceps femoris. Here it is emerging. Here are the popliteal vessels coming in beneath the semi-muscles and passing deep to the nerve. Above the knee, the sciatic nerve divides into two major nerves, the tibial nerve and the common peroneal nerve. The tibial nerve runs downward in the midline and passes between the two heads of gastrocnemius along with the popliteal vessels. The common peroneal nerve diverges laterally, running just behind the tendon of biceps femoris. It passes around the neck of the fibula, here's the fibula, and passes into this muscle, peroneus longus. We'll follow the further course of both these nerves in the next section. Of the muscles that we've seen in this section, the tibial nerve supplies popliteus, gastrocnemius, and plantaris. We'll conclude this section by briefly reviewing what we've seen of the vessels and nerves of this region. Here's the femoral vein and artery, the superior genicular arteries, lateral and medial, and the inferior genicular arteries, medial, and lateral. Here's the popliteal artery and vein. Here's the sciatic nerve, the tibial nerve, and the common perineal nerve. That brings us to the end of this section on the knee. In the next section, we'll look at the leg the ankle, and the joints of inversion and eversion of the foot.